Hi, I'm Adam Thayer, and we've got a real treat for you. We're celebrating 10 years of Stormwater Awareness Week. That is 10 years of free stormwater education. Today we have Andrew Taroskas and John Taroskas with us to help us better understand the beginnings of Stormwater Awareness Week. Andrew, let's start with you. Can okay. you tell us a little bit about what you do here at WGR? Yeah, so like you said, I'm Andrew, and I'm the film producer, um, film department manager here at WGR. So I do, you know, anything, I guess it's larger than just film, anything related to visual media. So whether that's, you know, filming a segment like this, you know, I worked with a, some other people on our team, which I think we're going to meet here in this video. Um, to, you know, we put together the set, you know, we got the cameras out, which are recording us today, and, nice you know, show, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and even, you know, like the poster behind you. I saw is, that. <laughs> you know, I've kind of overseen all that, so. Good, good, I, good. I spearhead the visual side of things. Terrific. John. And hi, I'm John Taraz, because I'm the operations manager for WGR Southwest, and Basically, I head up our consulting services, and stormwater is a lot of what we do around here. Hmm. We service the municipal, municipal areas, the municipalities, uh, industrial facilities, and construction industry, helping them comply with their stormwater NPDES permits. And that's kind of why, de why WGR got into doing training, is because there's a lot of training needed for these permits. Hmm. Uh, not only do people need to know what's in them and how to comply, but the permits themselves actually require that staff be trained, that uh, municipalities do community outreach, and it's a big part of it. And so it was just natural for us to look at an event like Stormwater Awareness Week as an opportunity to help people meet their permit requirements. Terrific. Well, let's throw this out to the both of you. What was the very essence of the creation of Stormwater Awareness Week? How did it come about? Well, you have to go back to 2012 and you have to remember what was going on in our country at 2000, in 2012. We were just coming off of the Great Recession, yeah. remember? And that was a hard economic time, very different than what we're experiencing now. I mean, today, 2020, 2021, we have our own challenges. Back then, the huge challenge was, was finances and business and just lack of, of funding to really do anything. And yeah. when it came to education, people didn't have money to spend. Oh, yeah. Well, and there was kind of what, um, you know, at the time, there was really only one place to go if you wanted stormwater education. It was a big national conference, which shall not be named. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, we, you know, at the time, like we couldn't afford to send our employees to that, and we realized that, oh, well, they don't have the corner on the market. There's no reason why we can't offer something similar. And the more we talked to other people, there was a felt need with that. So that led to Stormwater Awareness Week. And mm -hmm. from the beginning, it was always supposed to be a collaborative effort. It wasn't WGR's show. It still isn't WGR's show. We, we kind of provide the manpower to get it off the ground. Right, right. But, you know, we, even from the very first year, we were working with colleagues, um, uh, uh, you know, we call them friendly competitors, you mm -hmm. know, other consultants who do the same thing that we do to put on something that was bigger than any one of us. But you know, using video, I can't think of a better way of, than using video to reach the numbers of people that you wish yeah. to reach. Yeah, well video was not a big part of it in those early days. Uh, I think we were doing some innovative things in video and uh, the steps we were taking early on set us up to, well, be uniquely positioned for last year, 2020. Our, our, the complete year, what, that complete program was all video. And had we not been taking the baby steps all along, mm -hmm. I don't think we've been there. But in 2012, the, the challenge, like I said, was just ha having people be able to afford to do the training. And so we said, you know, the stormwater industry, we should be able to train ourselves. There's enough people who know enough things that why don't we just 
share our resources and what would happen if everybody just donated an hour? But back then it was live workshops. <laughs> If they just donated an hour, gave a workshop, and invited whoever would come. Making it a collaborative effort. Yeah. yeah. And so, so we got our friends and colleagues and friendly competitors from San Diego. Well, back 20, uh, 2012, it was just the Central Valley. We, that was big enough for us that first year. <laughs> yeah. But 2013, it became statewide. Wasn't it at the Port of Stockton back then? Uh, we did, year? did some of that. Uh, in fact, the stuff that the the events that we did at the Port of Stockton kind of was the seed to this whole whole idea. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, in my involvement with Stormwater Awareness Week, we've been dealing with themes every year. There's been a different theme and a different approach and a different way of just attracting a lot of attention and then and then using that as part of the way the plot yeah. sort of uh, develops. In 2014, you had a really interesting theme, though. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It involved a showdown. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, how did we choose the theme? <laughs> well, like, how did you choose the theme? I wanted yeah. to make a Western. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, I mean, I'm on board with that. Yeah. I mean, what, what guys don't want to strap on, you know, the gun belt yeah, and the yeah. cowboy hat. And the cowboy yeah. hat with the, uh, the clock and the bell tower, yeah. you know, closer and closer and closer yeah. to yeah. you. And, and you know, picturing Gary oh, Cooper, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Eastwood. Stormwater well, Awareness Week and Showdown. Tell me yeah, about that. Well, I mean, to answer your question about themes, it's only been recently that we were actually being very intentional hmm. with our theming. Um, but in the early years, a lot of it was guided by, oh, that would be cool. You know? <laughs> well, 2012, was it? The two thousand. Well, okay, so if we go back 2012, there really wasn't a theme other than stormwater education shouldn't be big business. That was, hmm. that still is kind of our mantra. Okay, um, I'll buy that. 2013, uh, there really wasn't a theme. I, you know, the promo video was a Twilight Zone style. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. It was kind of creepy. <laughs> it was kind of weird. <laughs> Got people's attention. Yeah. I but, watched Twilight Zone all the time. Well, and it yeah. had nothing to do with the event. I think what made 2014 unique was our gotcha. promo video actually tied into the event for the first time. You know, it was gotcha. the idea of the showdown and the Western. And, you know, it worked out perfectly with what was going on with the um, with the citizen lawsuits, the Clean Water Act lawsuits. Hence the showdown. Yeah. yeah so, so we got the idea just brainstorming, hey, wouldn't it be awesome if we got the t attorneys that represent the environmental groups the ngos and the attorneys representing the industrial groups hmm. and and we get two of the top <laughs> attorneys to appear on our show and and have it out debate it i out. love it <laughs> you know outside the courtroom just you know Take the gloves off and exactly. have it out. exactly yeah you know when, when we put the idea out there we we're like yeah it'll never happen <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Stormwater Awareness Week is where we see things yeah. like it'll there never happen happen. Yeah. And, yeah. and successfully. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they showed up and, you know, in true attorney fashion, they were too smart to actually draw their guns. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but they had a great conversation. It was an interesting event, and I think people liked it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, it's just as relevant now in 2021 as it was in 2014. Those citizen lawsuits... They're, they come out of the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act gives the ability, and some would say even the responsibility, to file lawsuits against uh, dischargers who are not complying with, with the Clean Water Act or with the NPDES mm -hmm. permits that uh, are a result of that. And so in order to protect water quality, the public has a mechanism to say, oh, no, no, we don't want purple water going out into this nice clean river or we don't want an oil slick on there you know we don't want this situation that we you know like so many situations that prompted the, the founding of the clean water act so they built into that federal act the ability for citizens to do that and so there are uh, watchdog groups these hmm. non-governmental organizations some would uh, say that uh, they're um, well, too, uh, too active, and others uh, would say they're not active enough. Uh, some would say that, you know, they, they go too far. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I don't think anyone can say that they are not 
a big motivator for dischargers to comply with our permit requirements. I'm Adam Thayer, and this is Stormwater Awareness Week 2021. We'll be back with more insights, so stay with us. Okay, so welcome everyone. We're gonna try something new here. So I'm Andrew Taraskis, and this is Jonah Sonner. Jonah, well, why don't you introduce yourself? I can't talk. You, no, you yeah. can't talk. Well, fitting, because you're the audio guy, so. It's yeah. all, he's got I'm, really good hearing. I'm Jonas Sonner. Uh, I do all of the sound design and uh, audio recording for um, Stormwater Awareness Week and PDU Week, which has kind of been brushed aside recently. We don't talk about PDU Week anymore. Um, <laughs> <But what? laughs> I'm working on PDU Week right now as we speak. I talk about it all the time, so. Okay. Mm. Well, anyway, uh, we, uh, we are normally behind the cameras, yes. although you'll see in some of these videos we'll be looking at, we are in front of the cameras, um, but, uh, or featured in some way. But uh, no, we just wanted to kind of give a, a commentary on our creative process, what we've gone through, some of the little behind the scenes uh, tips, or not tips, uh, Easter eggs yeah. we didn't know about. Yeah. Um, and also just give insight into who we are. We've done some pretty wild stuff in the name of Stormwater. Of Speaking best. of wild, what's our first video about? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Do you All like right, my well, segue? I just with bothered. that, you, you just... <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take that segue that we tripped over yeah. and go into 2014. Yeah, let's see 2014. Yep, that's still coming soon. It hasn't, mm -hmm. it hasn't arrived yet, but it's coming. I love those burn effects you did. And, uh, and this was shot here in Lodi. This yeah. isn't a set we built, we, uh, we rented it. This is um, Mickey Grove uh, Historical Society. I just want to talk about this real quick here. So it's, it's funny, like you guys might not know this, but most of these people here are friends or uh, staff. There's staff. a lot of staff there. Yeah, cowboys in that day and age uh, didn't look that healthy. Uh, mostly, <laughs> but um, yeah, this was uh, from Mickey Grove, Mickey Grove Park here in Mickey, Lodi. Yeah, Mickey Grove Historical Society, their yeah. museum that they have there. So they have like these. There's there's a uh, school building, and then like these three buildings that you mm -hmm. see right here. Yeah, and uh, poor Kevin, he was the only guy with the, the speaking role, and so he. Like you know, it. the guy that I feel sorry for is Aaron. Like yeah. way in the back, we stuck him under a blanket with a hat because we <laughs> needed somebody in the back there. But this was our days before we had wireless mics, so we snaked cables up uh, our yeah, guys' had... pant legs <laughs> to, to feed a microphone onto them. So they had to wrangle a cable while they're walking and doing all their blocking and then yeah. not trip anybody. All right, but let's anyway, yeah, keep, keep going. it going. That's Kevin right there who's doing the talking. Out of those three, only Blake, the guy in the middle right there. Did you notice Aaron disappeared in that yeah. shot? Yeah. Aaron disappeared. This is supposed to be Mike Lewis, but it's not. I just not. noticed it wasn't. I just saw his face. That's actually supposed to be Mike, too, but that's me. <laughs> yeah, the jeans are different. Yeah, they're very dark blue in that shot. I'll accept silver, gold, whatever you got. Just come over here and talk to me right now. Kevin just improv all of his lines. There, that's actually John, our office manager, and his brother Steve. I love the hard cuts where they're not <laughs> blocked in the same spot. A gunfight with no casualties, because you can't kill anybody in a stormwater promo, so. Yeah. You know, there's other options. Stormwater they casually have, have their guns <laughs> at the ready and then just put them away. If you're tired of spinning your heart, I think Mike surprised us all because we had no idea he was. Mike doesn't sound like this. We had no idea he was going to come out with a gravelly voice. Mm -hmm. He had to splice two takes together here, right? So because I think I started laughing at one point. Two completely different voiceovers. Get on up, come on out here and join us for some practical application. Don't forget. Looks like you almost forgot there. September 22nd through the 26th, Costumes are great. 
And watch him great. blow all of our props in one. Oh, there yeah. they go. That was supposed to be for additional takes, but yeah. no more takes now. Good thing he nailed it on the first take. Yeah, literally. <laughs> he nailed it. <laughs> Stuck it right on a nail. Yeah, 2014, that was our first experience. I remember you asked me, hey, your dad does audio work. He works for a radio station. Can you record something for us? Yeah. And uh, I was like, no. But <laughs> and then I, I twisted your arm yeah. and so you did it. So I had a table. I had a full, if you guys don't know what a mixer is, it's a, it's a big piece of audio equipment. So I had a full mixing board out there and cabled microphones on a set. It was so hot and had to run power to me. So we shot this it. like in July or something yeah. in the middle of the day. It was you guys, hot. You guys said come dressed wearing a button-down shirt. and uh, Why did I say wear a button-down? I don't remember, but I came wearing a stark white shirt. I do remember that. Yeah. <laughs> was it... I must have been... Was I thinking like you were also going to be in the probably, video? Probably, if I needed to be an extra. Okay. But I wouldn't have fit in in that. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so that was, uh, that was interesting. You know, we learned a lot from there. I think after that it was like, okay, I think next time I'm going to do it, we're going to have wireless microphones first. And, well, uh, and that was like the, I guess we had done one promo in the year earlier mm -hmm. but this was when we started really pushing the borders of let's have fun with the promos and do right. something that's right. you know maybe a little non-standard mm -hmm. of when you talk about promo video don't think western so right. it catches people's attention yeah you know, it just um, uh, it, it gets them to want to watch it like hey you know I can afford that I can yeah it's free <laughs> we, even I can afford that <laughs> oh, that line's good. Nice. All right, well, I'm here with two of the faces of Stormwater Awareness Week. Uh, these guys literally became the face of Stormwater Awareness Week, and I think the most notorious was 2014. Who could forget that oh, that, that was year? Crazy. So I have Kevin Harcourt and Mike Lewis here uh, with me, and you guys really epitomize the the stormwater awareness week one of the, the 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 logos that we had was stormwater education should not be big business and you shot it out literally yeah. yes. out of my hand yes. <laughs> that was fantastic that was a good shot it so, was a good shot so wow that was that was quite some years ago now uh and uh what do you remember of that showdown uh, of, of stormwater big business. Oh, I remember uh, it was just uh, it was just a lot of fun. We had uh, um, a good time making the western, and um, you know it was we had just a bunch of people that were you know playing parts and acting out, and and uh, I remember uh, one of the guys that used to work here yelled. Well, I can't afford that. <laughs> that was always Bob. That, yeah. was Bob? No, no, that was no. Blake. No, Blake. Blake. That was Blake. 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 That was right. <laughs> yeah, Bob's the one who had the uh, the piece of grass in his uh, mouth, <laughs> chewing on it. And uh, Denny Callahan was there, and uh, he was the, the sharpshooter inside the inside the jail or something. I like think that. we got every single one of our staff members in that film, and then some who would become staff members in the future. We even had Aaron Ortiz. He was sitting in the back yeah, with, with a poncho. Oh, yeah, he was a poncho. poncho. He yeah. was asleep. He had the easy job the whole time. He yeah. was asleep in the background. That was pretty good. That was good. Yeah. Why did we pick up on that theme? Why, why was that theme so relevant, especially in 2014? Well, I think when we, Kevin and I, first uh, got it, uh, became QSPs, one of the things that was required by our underlying certificate was the fact that we needed to have these PDHs at the time or PDUs, PDUs or whatever they were And called. so for that to happen, we would have to, at the time, there was a show in Las Vegas that you could go to, and uh, that was like twelve to $1,500 just for the show, and then your expenses yeah. to stay let's, there and Let's all clarify that. that for our audience. Yeah. Yeah. It, was a, it was a storm water show in yeah. Las Vegas. Right, right. In fact, it's a national show. It moved around from city to city to city and you had to pay a lot of money to be able to go and take the workshops. Right, right, and so we looked at twelve to $1,500 just for going to the program, plus expenses of, of a place to stay and eating, and, and we just thought, you know, that's way out of our budget, and we just really can't afford that, and we should be able to do that 
without um, you know having to outlay this kind of money. Right, right. And I think also at that time, YouTube was really starting to to get a lot of momentum, and there was a lot of good education. Of course, there's not so good education on YouTube <laughs> too, but there there was a lot of good, valuable stuff on there for free. And so we we're looking at that and like, wow, you know, you can actually get some of this free already. It was a good way of getting uh, PDU points for people, you know, or the the units. It and it was, was it was interesting. Some of the feedback that we were getting <clears throat> from other QSPs were the same thing: is that we just can't afford to go. We just can't afford to go. And how are we going right. to get these credits? You know, to or keep the time, you know, to get away from true. The, right, and you were the bad guy in the film. Oh, of course. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> I'm always a renegade. Yeah, it was perfect. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it was perfect. Fit his personality. I love that poster. Still yeah. on my wall. <laughs> yeah, I love it. We have it out in the hall. Here. I saw that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and so you were you were um, basically portraying the the big business, the big of business Stormwater yeah. that that had the community and host, holding them hostage. Right. And I guess we see we were seeing that a little bit in the Stormwater industry where there weren't a lot of options in those days. Well, there was they were so really small. There wasn't very many companies that you know only the big really the big business had, had monopolized on everybody. Yeah, that's true. You didn't have a, you didn't have options. You either participated in that or um, looked for something that the state would put out some way to get it. So it was it was quite the challenge, especially when we first got in. And when we first got in, uh, we just didn't have the means to pursue all the things that were out there. Right, right. I think one of the things too that we wanted to do was to bring education to the masses. Uh, many times those regional, statewide, or national programs, they're really reaching out to the consultants. In fact, you go, oh, and who do you see? We see other regulators and other consultants, but not too many of the the guy in the field. Right. You know, you two actually teamed up on a project in the city of Stockton. That's actually where some of this these ideas took place. Tell me a little bit about what you guys did. What did we do, though? We did their uh, their inspections, their stormwater inspections. Their stormwater inspections, and we got For involved in the um, fog. The fats, oil, and fats, oil, and Yeah, so we went out and helped them do that. and um, But we literally did that for, like, what, a couple of years, and we did every single stormwater inspection in the, in the, in the city. So for two years, you were meeting with, with literally with the guy on yeah. the street, the guy who is who dumping hated, out his water. He was dumping <laughs> out his water, and he was hating life because we were there. Yeah. You know, and, and they were getting charged for the amount of even the rainwater that was getting dropped on their property that was running off, and they were... Right. I remember once we went up uh, to a restaurant. We were doing restaurants and, and automotive places mostly. Went up to a restaurant, and there's a gentleman comes out of the back of the restaurant. The moment we walk up, it couldn't be more perfect. And he's got a five-gallon bucket of some kind of, I don't know what. Well, he had noodles. And he it dumps it noodles. into the trash can, and he gives us this great big smile, like, I'm successful, look what I've done. And about that time, we pointed to the bottom of the dumpster. It's just running and out. And it's just running out and, and going to the storm drain. And he's like this, and we're like, no, <laughs> like this. Like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's kind of when we started to realize those individuals aren't going to the regional or national shows. No. They're, they're not there. No, no. And they don't have time. The stormwater industry, as far as meeting the educational need of the masses, was basically missing it. Sure. And that's what I think we were targeting in, in those videos and then later in Stormwater Awareness Week. And, and so we've gotten creative. Uh, you know, uh, you guys did a lot of workshops. Not, you weren't always the sheriff and the bad guy. You were teaming up to do education. And uh, I can remember doing some workshops in very creative locations even Home Depot. Tell yeah. us a little bit about uh, how you would draw in the average Joe or Sally to come to our workshop. So we... we um, well, we'd make a spectacle out of ourselves. Yeah, That's what of course. we'd do. Yeah, and Mike we would together, go, we would always go into a spectacle. Home Depot. We'd lay cones out in the parking lot, and people would just start to be curious, and they're just coming up shopping at Home Depot. And we would go inside and show them how to go through Home Depot and buy things to be able to sample a storm drain. And then we'd make a big production out of it. And uh, so it was always kind We're of blocking a, off a storm drain. We, yeah. we, um, 
were doing all kinds of things. Yeah. Home Depot got excited about it and was actually giving out hot dogs to everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah, they were cooking yeah. and everything. They gave away so. hot dogs. Um, the second year that we were there, they set up some bleachers um, because they were uh, thinking a big crowd was coming. They were selling hot dogs. Not selling hot dogs, giving away hot dogs. So, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was fun, though. Right, yeah. and we, we created our construction sandbox here for that very same reason, so that we could get the average person to come and see BMPs laid Yeah, out. so the, the average contractor could come here and uh, actually learn how to lower pH. We, we did quite a few things with that, as um, literally had a sandbox out back. And, mm -hmm. and I th think mostly, to be honest with you, you know, when Kevin and I first got into the QSP, we're reading all this information from the state, all these requirements, everything that needs to happen. And you're trying to picture, because it's, it's relatively new to us, we're trying to picture what this looks like. And so we decided this kick the can idea was the best. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. You know, because the kick the can idea was how do you actually implement that, you know, and people hear fiber roll and they hear filter sock and they hear all these things. That you don't really know what yeah. they are. And, and I think a lot of it, we were, we were going out in the field and really just have a fiber roll laying on the side of the right. hillside. It wasn't staked in properly. So it required us to learn how, of course, we weren't into in installation. Mm -hmm. So we had to learn how proper installation was. Right. And as an inspector, the best way to do it is to actually... Right. The Do best, it. One of the best ways to learn is by doing. And I think uh, uh, our response was really, I think the people loved it when they came here. Right. They really, they left with uh, really good knowledge. Right. In fact, we would have installers come. Uh, we had the uh, Mark's Hydro Seating sure. come out and actually blow on. Hydro, hydraulic mulch and hydro seed so so that they could demonstrate that. and explain all the difference the matrix and the you know all the different glues that were going into that that we didn't understand right didn't we understand learned that. we learned a ton. learned so much and that's yeah. what stormwater awareness week became it became very practical very hands-on uh and really i think uh meeting a whole completely different demographic than those large <laughs> big business stormwater education events are and and you know to be fair they have their place and they have their purpose and they they serve a very good purpose uh we we're just kind of tongue-in-cheek playing off of that but you know recognizing that they they have a place but we were trying to meet us an educational need that was not being met and it what i mean it was really good for our company too at the time was that we made these relationships at the at of course, we always. What about the barbecues? Yeah, we always. Had oh yes, we. Yeah. Oh, man. right. People with food. Remember right? the steak? Yeah. Oh, the steaks. Remember yes. those things? Oh yes, I did. Yeah. Or the, oh, but getting back to that, we we'd invite them. We'd have a like this great barbecue, but we re, our relationship built with these different companies, right. and whenever they needed something, they would. We were available to call for advice or. Um, but it changed. And we didn't. You know, we didn't charge for that either. We just uh, we it helped them, and then. It yeah. turned into business later on. And we changed our, 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 the personality of the company changed here in this location as we started thought, thinking about, all right, if we want people to come in, we need to offer them something. So we're gonna just do these fantastic lunches. And, and so your, some of your workshops, we started you know, really stepping up your, right. you know, our game. I love that part. I did yeah. too. Yeah, there was nothing better because <laughs> yeah. we're like, look, we're going to bore you with all this technical stuff, but we're going to feed you well, so you're, it's going to be a win But not only did we learn that, but all of our Stormwater uh, Awareness Week partners did. You know, I, I can think of several, Condor Earth Technology. They, they were having lots of workshops, inviting people in and, and doing the same type of thing and Frog Environmental down in Southern California. And many of our partners over the years realized saw the value in building relationships with people because at some point those people are going to have questions i think and i think what uh, the real blessing of this was is the is we started to see an industry change we started to see consultants that wouldn't really talk to each other uh coming together and uh, combining forces and and we're you know convincing them and and they were convinced that we weren't after your customer base we're just after to spread to spread the wealth, as it were. And we've had all kinds of consulting companies join up with us and team up with us each year. So it's been quite amazing. Yeah, so 10 years of free stormwater education. Let's go back just for a moment to the showdown. 
Oh, what, yeah. what are some of your your <laughs> memories from that that film shoot? Oh, this, my memory was uh, Andrew, right? Getting our director. So, our director, getting so upset at Mike because, you know, he, he had these piles of stormwater. You know, the memory you stuck them on the oh, stake. They were flyers. They're the flyers, flyers, right? We printed Mike, out enough for multiple takes. Multiple takes. But Mike took I the had whole... I like 25. Eight, 20, just about 25, yeah, right? Yeah, Boom! On the stake on the wall. On the nail. Yeah. On the nail. Yeah. And then... Uh, it's a good thing you nailed it on that tape. Oh, yeah. I nailed it. Yeah, it was <laughs> oh, yeah. perfect. Yeah. But what about you shooting at me? Yeah, I well, thought that was perfect, you know? Yeah. I, I shot... You were holding up your piece of paper, waving it around, and I shot it right over your How head. many times did you miss? Never. So how, how, did, shot. how did the paper fly out of his hand? <laughs> Actually, we had something tied to it, a fishing pole. No, no, we had a fishing pole. Right? Right? A fishing line. It had to be like... It out of the way. <laughs> oh, and I had to... Had, and we had to get the sound just right. How many times right. it took me like 20 times I to don't do know. that right? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, well, and also the person the yanking, yanking it, it was yeah, a little off. Without ripping it or... The thing was... Or, or you'd hear the shot <laughs> five seconds later, it flies out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. But, but we were... Uh, we became... You know, stars after that. It was quite oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah, it was awesome. Okay. Actually, actually, that's been one of the funnest thing about Stormar Awareness Week is now you walk into a client's office or into a maybe a workshop that the water board's doing, and so many people go, "Hey, I know, oh, I know you. that guy. <laughs> you're yeah. the guy in the western. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you're like a rock star of stormwater. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 It's pretty funny, it's, but it's it's been a Fun 10 years, and uh, thank you for being a part of it. Uh, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Yeah, you, working here made it fun. It actually, yeah. it actually, those things were like super fun. The, yeah, um, because they, they took, it was it was out of the dorm of the daily inspections and the, the typical grind sometimes that happens. And so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I loved it. Plus yeah. we got to go to, you know, up to the EPA building and, and do a bunch of stuff in, in, in those 10 year, in that 10 year period, so. It's been a lot of fun. I remember some other stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> which, <clears throat> which probably shouldn't be said yeah, on no, camera. No, probably wouldn't <laughs> said on camera. Yeah. So so Mike and Kevin, thank you, thank you for being a part of Stormwater Awareness Week. Yeah, thanks for yeah, having thanks us. Thanks for having us. It was pretty fun. Welcome to Stormwater Awareness Week. My name is John Taraskis, and I'm your host for this week's kickoff event. And it's going to be a great event this week. We have over 50 different workshops being offered from San Diego to Reading and many points in between. And we have uh, already have over 1,200 registrants. It's going to be an awesome week. This year, we've added something new uh, to live uh, web broadcasted events. This one being the first to kick the week off. And then on Friday, we have another event uh, that we're going to broadcast talking about BAT, BCT with a, a panel discussion. So you won't want to miss that. We hope you can take advantage of much of this free training this week. Because as we say around here, stormwater education should not be big business. Well, as I mentioned, this uh, program is being broadcasted live, but it's also being recorded. So it'll be available for you to watch at any time immediately after the conclusion of, of today's program. If you have technical difficulties uh, with the stream, try a couple things. Down at the base of your screen, you can always set it back a few seconds and try to uh, delay it a few moments and that might help. But if you have to leave us for any reason, uh, don't worry, you can pick it up right where you left off uh, or you can watch it, as we've mentioned, recorded at any time. At the end of each of the two parts of today's uh, discussion, we are going to have a question and answer time. And so right there where you're watching from the Stormwater Awareness Week uh, digital classroom dashboard, there is a place where you can email in questions. So you might be uh, jotting down notes or thinking of questions while our presenters are talking today. So today we have joining for us uh, for the stormwater showdown, we're calling it. Two prominent attorneys who are very active in stormwater court cases, uh, but often they come from two very different perspectives. So first, I wanna welcome our two attorneys to today's program, Melissa and Michael. And I wanna tell the audience a little bit about you first. So we'll start with Melissa Thorne with Downey Brand. 
Com. She, uh, she has complex administrative and litigation practice uh, experience re revolving around one of California's uh, most precious resources, and that's water. A uh, few attorneys share her in-depth knowledge and experience in the area of water quality regulation and litigation. She has litigated major water cases in state and federal courts, including arguing a rare case taken up by the California Supreme Court, which reaffirmed the requirement to consider economics when state governments go above and beyond federal requirements uh, that are contained in the decades old Clean Water Act. She also regularly appears in front of administrative agencies on issues uh, regarding uh, water quality policy and the regulation of wastewater, stormwater, and recycled water. An article in Sacramento Lawyer Magazine touted her practice as providing leadership, valuable contribution, insight into this constantly evolving area of law. She represents both the municipal and industrial entities all over California, from San Diego to Humboldt uh, uh, counties, and she provides valuable compliance assistance and works with her municipal industrial clients to develop cost-effective methods for complying with uh, today's ever-tightening water quality regulations. And she also is able to effectively deal with pretty complex technical issues like whole effluent toxicity because of her science background. She has a BS in MS in biological sciences and this aids her in this effort. So Melissa has received the highest peer rating, AV preeminent, from Martindale Hubble, and she has served as chair of the Clean Water uh, Subcommittee of the Association of California Water Associations and serves as an active member of the Attorneys Committee uh, to, of the California Association of Sanitation Associ Agencies. So Melissa, I want to thank you to our you. Uh, program. And also, Michael, I want to welcome you to our program, Michael Lazo. He's with uh, Lazo Jury, and uh, he has been practicing environmental law in the San Francisco Bay Area for over 20 years. Uh, he graduated with honors from Rutgers Law School in New York um, uh, in 1989, and has helped establish the Rutgers Public, law, uh, Public Interest Law Foundation. In 2003, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle named Michael as one of the top 25 lawyers in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mike sits on the executive committee of the environmental law section of the Bar Association of San Francisco, as well as the board of directors of the Golden Gate Audubon Society. He has represented environmental organizations including Earth Justice Environmental Law Clinic at Stanford. He was the executive director of the Water Keepers Northern California, and he served as the San Francisco Bay Keeper and as more recently represented the California Sports Fishing Protection Alliance. So welcome both of you Hi, to John. today's program. I understand too that there's a little trivia that many folks don't understand that although many times you're on the opposite sides of the courtroom, you actually work together. Melissa, where, where was it that you worked together? Well, we worked at Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund in the summer of 1989. Michael had just started as an associate and I was a summer clerk there. Okay. Okay, so, yeah. Well, uh, we want to jump into today's topic, and we're talking water quality issues. Um, you, you two represent, you know, very different perspectives, and I think it's of great interest to the stormwater community, uh, both of your perspectives. And so we want to hear what you have to say about the issues. And so we'll kick it off this, this uh, today with, uh, in your opinion, what is the biggest challenge concerning water quality that the state of California is currently facing? And we'll start it off with Michael. Well, I think um, consistent with this panel, like one of the biggest issues is still stormwater pollution, whether it's industrial sources or municipal sources, that just the sheer volume of, of um, pollution that is flowing off of our city streets, off of you know thousands of industrial sites. Is, is a relatively large percent probably of what's going into rivers and streams and the coastline. Um, <clears throat> I would always add um, irrigated lands as well, which is both a stormwater issue as well as non-stormwater for irrigation return flows and things like that. That's throughout the valley and also in the central coast, quite a few large areas of the state where that's a, an ongoing challenge to try to get the pollution levels under control. Okay, okay. Melissa, what, what do you see being the biggest challenge facing California? 
I think it's prioritization. I think one of the problems is we're chasing a lot of different issues all at once, and there's only so many resources to go after all of these things. And so I think we need to do a better job of prioritizing what are the big ticket items. For example, uh, the trash policy that's be recently been uh, proposed. And in many cases, especially for small municipalities, that may become the only priority that they have the re resources to mm -hmm. go after. And there may be other things like pesticides or um, things that are much more acutely toxic than trash that might be a better, higher priority mm -hmm. to protect mm -hmm. fish. So those are, I think, the biggest challenges, trying to get the priorities straight. No, <clears throat> go ahead, Michael. What do yeah, you think? In terms of prioritization, though, some of these types of pollution um, don't lend themselves well to prioritizing because in the case of stormwater, it's tens, you know, roughly 10,000 facilities, say, around the state or for, for irrigated lands, 30,000 farms in the valley alone, roughly. These aren't precise numbers. But so, you know, the prioritization would be just to, you know, getting it set up, but it, it's kind of hard to, to imagine how one prioritizes within that you know, large category of discharges, it's, it's difficult. So um, I do think the state, though, is, you know, needs to, you know, staff up better. You know, however they do that, the fees have to sort of reflect the magnitude of, of what they're trying to do and hopefully spread it out enough where, you know, no one discharger has to bear, you know, too much of the full brunt of, of that to, to make sure that the state has enough resources to follow mm -hmm. through on these programs. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about prioritization, what what do you think should be the highest priority for the state? Um, well, I think more acutely toxic things that are you see, um, you know, something that could cause a fish kill or things like that would be higher priority. So some of the pesticide issues, the problem, one of the things that we're, we're seeing with pesticides is the pesticides keep changing. So where they were going after chlorpyrifos and diazinon, now those are being phased out a lot of places, and so now we're seeing new pyrethroids, and those keep changing all the time, which one you're going after. So sometimes it's hard to, to prioritize be beyond a specific category like pesticides. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, in my mind, pesticides are a higher priority than trash because trash is more of an aesthetic mm -hmm. problem. Does it vary uh, in different places around the state? Uh, would the priority be different? Yes, and I think that also needs to be very site specific. Okay, Michael, what would you see as being a high priority uh, as far as a pollutant or, um, or, you see, or is it what you were saying? I don't saying? think I have a favorite per se. I think they all have their place for some people down uh, in Southern California where um, the beaches and you know all the activities that go on along the shoreline, you know, trash is important to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just aesthetic; it's probably economic to the same. You know, people don't want to be visiting some places that you know are have a big pile of trash that came out of the L.A. River. Um, but obviously, in the Central Valley uh, and even the Central Coast, where um, there's a lot of pesticide use just for the agricultural community that's obviously going to play a much higher role. Mm -hmm. So that's the system of regional boards lends itself well to making sure that each region focuses on things that, okay. that those boards deem important. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's more generally a lack of resources uh, to cover the, the different types of concerns that are out there. There's okay. just not enough resources in these agencies to cover everything. Okay. Well, that leads uh, um, well into our next question. There is a legal challenge, I understand, by an NGO against the industrial general permit, stating that the newly adopted permit is not <laughs> adequately protecting waterways throughout the state. Now, we're not going to talk so much about that ruling, but in your opinion, are the state's NPDS permits, uh, general permits specifically for construction, industrial, and municipalities, are they sufficiently protective of water quality? Why or why not? And Melissa, we'll start with you. Well, I think a little bit the jury may still be out on that because we don't have as much data as we would like to have. And so I think the way the industrial permit has been set up to have new types of monitoring to try to get to that issue, I think that will help. Um, right now it's hard to say whether it's making a difference because we don't know what impacts that those discharges are having. Um, in some senses, I think the construction 
uh, permit has actually caused problems because we're seeing a lack of sedimentation in some of the waterways. Mm. So the bay is getting clearer, which is causing other issues like nutrient problems. Mm. And we've, I've even heard biologists in the Delta hearing say that the lack of turbidity in the Delta may be one of the problems for the little fish, like the smelt, because there's no place for them to hide. So sometimes we have to be a little careful what our regulations do because we as humans may be causing problems that are unanticipated. Yeah, right. Well, interesting. Michael, what do, what do you think about the permits and how they are today? <clears throat> well, the I think the jury's out as to whether they're going to work over time. I do agree with that. Um, and I think it largely depends on how individuals uh, implement uh, some of the requirements and what people believe they have to do to comply with the best available technology standard mm -hmm. and things like that, which, um, you know, people have differing opinions perhaps about what exactly that constitutes. Um, I do think that the permit could be more readily enforceable. I, I, you know, we don't agree that there's not sufficient data to have perhaps done numeric uh, limits that would reflect best available technology and best conventional technology that would make those more enforceable and at the same time provide clarity to dischargers. Uh, but, you know, that that issue is uh, done for the moment, at least for mm -hmm. the lifespan of this permit, so we'll wait for the next round on that and hopefully uh, the, the monitoring requirements will actually do what staff is hoping they do, but um, mm -hmm. We'll have to wait and see how it goes. We, we've heard these stories before. The, right. It's not like the first iteration of this permit. And that was the goal of the last permit as well, to gather in data and so to be ready to actually do a BAT uh, calculation and put it in the permit. And that didn't happen, obviously. Um, and so I'm hoping, I would hope that the next round will, will be smoother on that. So, so by talking about a next round, it sounds like you're saying that they're not sufficiently protective of water quality is that no I said uh, I hope I hope uh, it works okay I mean, I, you know, so so the jury nobody out. can say no one can um, say um, I would say again it's all it, it does require BAT and BCT if everybody put in what I think is BAT yeah. BCT I'm sure the waters would be very clean okay. but I'm sure there's going to be a whole variation of what people believe those requirements um, lead to and so to the extent people think it only means you know, putting a simple filter in a drain or, you know, sweeping their industrial site, mm -hmm. that's not going to protect water quality. Uh, those those measures are part of the, the overall program of yeah. facility shed, but they're not going to get anyone anywhere near these numbers unless it's a totally clean facility to begin with. It just doesn't have much industrial activity. But most facilities are going to need more than that. Um, okay. So. And the other piece of the puzzle is the receiving water limitations, which we're still waiting. That was part of the state board's promise when they took up the petitions on the LA MS4 permit, that they were going to have a statewide policy on how to do the receiving water limitation section of the permit, and we're still waiting on that. So it's really unclear at this point what that's going to mean in new permits and how those issues get enforced. Mm. Because right now, with the cause or contribute language, I mean, does it mean one molecule, that if you're putting one molecule of copper into a water body that you're contributing? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that that was really the intent, and that word contribute is only, it's not used in the Clean Water Act at all, it's only in one regulation that deals with um, whether you need to have effluent limits or not. I think it was, if it was one molecule, though, that you'd probably be implementing BAT at that point. <laughs> it actually got down to one molecule. But. Can I get that in? Can you, yeah. can you sign that, Michael? You can either put in this expensive <laughs> treatment system or get it down to one Good molecule. thing I've got this on video. Okay, all right. Well. Um, uh, a part of this whole process is obviously the, the TMDL, the total maximum daily process. Um, and and w it's been quite a few years now that this process has been underway here in California. And of course, this comes from the Clean Water Act. Is it on the right course, Michael? We'll start with you. Do you feel this TMDL process is on the right course here in California? Is it going to a achieve the, the objectives of the Clean Water Act as it is situated right now? Or do you foresee any problems? Um, my general sense of the TMDL program, and I was a lot more involved in the, in the 90s when we were beefing up the lists and 
you know, getting the TMDLs um, going just to develop the loadings and things like that. But the key to that whole the whole thing is, you know, we have a lot of TMDLs now. I, there's still a lot more to go, as I understand it. Um, but they don't they won't change anything on the ground unless you also have a decent implementation plan that goes with it. And that's the state's um, water code is good on that front, at least in our state, you actually have to have an implementation plan. A lot of states around the country don't even do that. They just have a loading and maybe some permits change in the MPDS program, but nothing else mm. will change. But here we still, um, the general sense I think from the environmental community is that the imp implementation plans are kind of weak. Um, there's a few good examples. I think I hear the Gualala River is, uh, is always a good example. Um, I believe that's the river. Um, but most of them, they're kind of vague, uh, a bit nebulous. They might have some timelines, but what people are actually supposed to do to meet this overall loading requirement for an entire watershed becomes kind of lost in those. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the main concern with um, the TMDL when, program. When you say implementation plan, what do you mean by that? How, how where, where does that come into play? Well, the TMDL technically is just a loading requirement. So, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever stretch of river or sometimes a whole watershed, I guess, they'll just pick a number that the science sort of dictates. This is the, the loading capacity of this river, and this is how much, how many pounds, say, of, mm -hmm. of that pollutant that can go into that watershed and still meet the standards. And then they'll calculate, you know, how much the river's above for example, okay. and then this is how much we have to eliminate in order to bring it back into compliance with standards. And it's the how do we go from where we are to that loading capacity uh, that is would be the implementation plan. And in California, the, the boards are required to prepare those and put them in the basin plan. So they mm -hmm. are, you mm -hmm. know, at least um, generally an enforceable document, but they're only as enforceable as the language that gets put into them. So if it just says, you know, do your best to yeah. to uh, keep your property nice. Um, you know, that's not going to be enforceable. Nobody's still going to know what to do. So that's okay. an extreme example. I okay. don't think anything written like that. But um, it, that's the main concern, as I said. Sure, sure. That's out there is that the implementation plans aren't concrete enough. Like, okay, you property owner, you reduce your sediment by X percent, and everybody does that. And if everybody does that, right. we can calculate the sediment. We'll so so the TMDL process obviously involves then waste load allocations where everybody gets a piece of that TMDL pie. For the NPDS permits. Yeah. yeah. And so um, if everybody stays within their piece of the pie, their waste load allocation, do you see um, receiving water being protected adequately? Well, I'm sure then for every TMDL, it's going to be a question of people hope so, but they probably aren't going to be okay. sure for, okay. um, for any given watershed. Okay. They hope the calculations will be right. But even in the industrial permit right now, for example, there's this two-year process or so before we start seeing uh, waste load allocations for particular watersheds or particular regions uh, coming into the industrial permit. So there's still mm -hmm. this even a delay there, yeah. even where I think you have some implementation plans that do put numbers out there for storm, industrial stormwater discharges, mm -hmm. and there's still even a disconnect between, a, in this case, an NPDES permit and those uh, okay. waste load allocations. Okay. Melissa, what do you think of the TMDL process? Well, I think it is slow, both to recognize there's many cases where we have water bodies that were listed and put on the 303D list back in the 90s. Um, when Mike and I first started working on TMDL stuff, and some of it isn't up to date. So we have many instances where things aren't impaired anymore and they're not coming off the list. They get on faster than they come off. Mm -hmm. And then we have other instances where we have TMDLs in place and the water body is now not impaired anymore and, and there's no mechanism really to get rid of the TMDL. So it's mm -hmm. not deemed impaired anymore and, and we have several instances down in Southern California where that's the case where like for ammonia the treatment plants all put in nitrification denitrification and now there's no more ammonia problem or where we have site specific objectives that come in and then how do you put those into place with the TMDL process so I think there's some disconnects uh, on that end and I think we still have to see how it plays out with the stormwater you know there's not a whole lot of instances where we've seen TMDLs incorporated hmm. into stormwater permits yet. Yeah, yeah. Now this uh, trash policy that's out that you just mentioned mm -hmm. a little while ago, 
uh, they're taking a little bit of a different approach with that. Um, as right. far as a TMDL, do you think that approach is going to be effective or overly burdensome? I think it's going to, it <clears throat> creates a priority that doesn't exist. So for the places in Southern California that Michael was talking about, they already have TMDLs in place where there were big problems, and I agree that there were problems with trash, you know, whenever there'd be a big storm, Long Beach or some of the other um, terminal beaches would have trash coming from the river channels. But that's, we don't see that in the Central Valley, and there's no impairments listed for trash. Mostly it's a either along the roadways, and, and Caltrans already has um, requirements to deal with trash, or it's people using the water bodies mm -hmm. in boats or fishermen that are leaving the trash there. So it's not even a stormwater issue when you have trash. Right. So I think there's a little bit of a disconnect. I think the places that have trash problems, we should have a program, and whether it's a TMDL or some other thing, to right. try to deal with trash. But I don't know that we need to have this priority for every location in California. It's right. just not a problem everywhere. Michael, you agree with that? You, I can't say I've kept up with the trash issues. I, I did work on the Southern mm -hmm. California trash TMDL litigation, but uh, since then mm -hmm. I, I haven't been quite as up to date on what's happening. I know it was an issue in the San Francisco right. Bay Area. Some of the groups were definitely pushing for more trash controls there because you have... And they this, changed the permit down there to yeah. accommodate. But as far so as... Other, what other parts of the state that I wouldn't right. be familiar with. As far as taking a more dynamic approach to TMDLs in general, things change with time. Should... Do you well, agree I, with that? Um, I think I once had a, at least a theory that once you're on the list, you're on the list forever. <laughs> yeah, that was actually the position I took, and I suspect that would be my position if I were to look closely at it, saying, well, once it's in place, you've got to keep it in place and make sure it doesn't... You know, go back to what it was. But um, that being said, you know, to the extent there's an enforceable permit in place that, you know, takes care of an entire problem, if that was the case, right. for example, for nitri uh, denitrification, um, um, then, you know, maybe there's some uh -huh. circumstances where it does make sense or it makes no practical difference. So. All right. Well, thank you, Melissa and Michael. We're going to open it now to you, our audience. So use that uh, email to uh, email in questions for us uh, right there on the right side of your digital classroom dashboard. And uh, let's see, let's take a look at uh, some of our questions we have here. All right. Um, well, I, I think you kind of addressed this, but let's go ahead and ask this one anyways. Are numeric effluent limits necessary to protect water quality, or is the current BMP-based permit sufficient? Um, I think we start with you last, Melissa. Why don't we open up with Michael? What do you think of numeric effluent limits? Well, they're not necessary because we can enforce the permit as it's currently written, and it doesn't have a numeric effluent limit. Um, I do think the NALs are going to be important to how the permit um, gets implemented and to indicate to people whether or not they've um, put in enough effort as they should. Um, I do think if you had numeric effluent limits, um, it would obviously be more readily enforceable and folks would definitely have a clear marker as to when they can stop making adjustments to their site. If they hit the numbers, they're, they're done. Um, but we're not there yet. I think the permit as it's written is, is enforceable, I do think. Um, uh, BAT and BCT uh, is a clear requirement and um, you know I do think by its very nature it does evolve over time and as of now we do have um, you know a lot of good options out there you know for the uh, mm -hmm. for facilities that uh, it's not an economic issue uh, there's definitely effective treatment systems that actually can hit these numbers these days at least um, one or two of the of the more robust systems you know, can hit all of the benchmarks and all of the NALs. Um, and uh, other facilities, you know, sequencing various types of uh, management practices um, can get you closer to those. It depends on, you know, how much pollution folks are dealing with at their site. So I do think it's enforceable, but um, I do think the permit would be, and the, and the discharger community would be well served by eventually a, a clear numeric effluent limitation for BAT and BCT. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't think that numeric effluent limits are required, and you know, we've had lots of conversations, and I don't know that EPA agrees with that, but we do have a lot of case law that says that numeric effluent limits are not required, and you can have a narrative effluent limit, or you can do uh, BMPs in lieu of numeric effluent limits. So I think that it's definitely not a requirement. I know that Michael would like it to be numeric because it is easier to enforce, but 
I think there are challenges with that because the technologies are fairly new. I know people are having trouble that have put in technologies that don't work the way that they thought that they would. And so having a numeric may put somebody in non-compliance in a situation where they're trying their hardest and doing everything possible to try to be in compliance. And just having people be in violation for violation's sake doesn't really get you to cleaner water. Okay, okay. Let me um, take a look here. Another question. Um, Okay, what do you um, see being the future of NPDES permits in California? Um, are they what they should be, or will there be significant changes in the future? And I guess that kind of goes along with what we were already asking. Well, eventually there will be numeric effluents at some point. When, um, you know, right now, I think staff for the State Board is indicating that this permit will provide all the data that they'll need to devise numeric limits the next round, which is scheduled for five years, but the last <laughs> permit took, was it 17 years? or 87. Yeah, it was yeah. quite a long time. Um, so again, the f that's the only kind of obvious change. And um, <clears throat> other than that, I'm, I'm sure it'll, it'll continue to maintain a similar framework to what we've seen since 87. Hopefully they can be more streamlined. I think there's a lot of extra things in these permits that mm -hmm. don't need to be there. I mean, the LA MS4 permit is over 500 pages. I mean, you pretty much have to be, have a PhD to figure out like every single thing and all these Gantt charts of when everything has to be done. And then it's really easy for you to trip up and be in violation of your permit because you didn't find something on page 364. So I would like them to be more streamlined. I think they've gotten a little burdensome in micromanaging. Okay. Okay. Here's another question. Uh, why, why, are, why do citizen lawsuits even happen? What allows for citizen lawsuits of NPDES permit holders? Melissa, let's start with you. Sure. Under the Clean Water Act, there's specific statutory authority for citizen suits, and that allows citizens to not supersede the authority of the agencies, but to, to come in interstitially and, and support, or where a state is not, or EPA is not enforcing, they can come in and take enforcement actions. Okay. Okay. Pretty much. So it's in the federal law. Yeah. yeah. So it's... It's, it's not going to change Part of the Clean Water soon. Act. Yeah. Right. We don't have a similar thing under Porter Cologne in California. Yeah. So it's federal law. It's part of the Clean Water Act. Well, um, Michael, are, are these lawsuits then needed um, or have they become excessive? I mean, I, we know we were talking historically they were put into place. But have they become excessive or are there abuses or, or do you see that they're actually needed? Uh, I think they're needed. Uh, the resources that the regional boards have or the state board or its office of enforcement, um, I don't think those uh, are nearly enough staff to go out, look at a site, do a site inspection, um, then follow that up with whatever enforcement level the board might want to choose to do if there was a problem. Um, there's just not enough people. I think there's literally a couple of people in each region. Mm -hmm. uh, the Central Valley might have more because it's it's more it's a bigger region. But um, there's really not that many people assigned the task of getting out there and doing site inspections and enforcement. So, um, and I do think in California certainly, uh, I don't see any, a, any excessive citizens. I'm sure there's a case here or there that you know there would be a. a a reasonable debate about, well, mm. did you really need to bring that case? Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, folks are looking for, you know, cases that should be brought. And then there, are, you know, we don't, the citizen supervision is kind of a big hammer. It doesn't really allow a lot of subtlety. There's some some legal doctrines like uh, uh, the Supreme Court's Gwaltney case, which requires ongoing violations, which don't encourage people to s sit back and not file a case if they think there's a violation. Yeah. It kind of says you got to yeah. keep going um, if you want to take advantage of the incentives that the statute right. has, which in includes um, getting a, a, a result, whatever the settlement might be, as well as attorney's fees and costs and things like that. Um, you know, like any other business or enterprise, you know, th the groups mm -hmm. who decide to make this part of their mission as a nonprofit even still need to pay their bills and things like right. that. So there's various incentives that, that are, 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 are not quite as right. subtle as they could be. Um, so anyway, I don't, but I don't think there's excessive cases. I think people pick their cases wise. It's kind of a professional enforcement 
uh, kind of bar out there in the yeah. state of California. And uh, there's always going to be some particular cases that, you know, yeah. people can debate about. Yeah, I know, Melissa, a lot of people that come to you feel they're quite excessive. What, what's they your do. thoughts? Uh, I think there are some cases where I can see why they were brought because people are either not doing anything or they didn't sign up for a permit or, you know, they haven't prioritized mm -hmm. as well as they should have. And so there are some cases that I would say were valid cases. There's other cases where I've had clients that have come into compliance during the 60-day notice mm -hmm. period, and that was the point of the 60-day notice period was to put both the agencies on notice that there was a potential problem so they could come in and enforce, which unfortunately there's not enough time for them to really do that. But within that 60 days, if you come into compliance under the Gwaltney case, you're supposed to be protected. But some of the plaintiff's organizations know that it's going to cost about $20,000 or so to fight if they file a complaint to file a motion to dismiss and they want that money instead. And so I think that that's just wrong, that that's really just a shakedown for money mm. and I don't agree that, that that's necessary in those kinds of cases. And there's been other cases where it's been excessive attorney's fees. In some cases, the lawyers on the other side are getting, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars an hour. And certainly, you know, none of my clients are paying that. So I, I think there are some, some abuses. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, um, do you see those or? No, I mean, the, well, on the fee front, the market rates are what they are, and we don't, mm. no, no one attorney controls what those are. So that's what the, the statute entitles one to if you prevail on a case. The, um, we have settled some cases where things happened in the notice period where, you know, there was no more discharge or something like that. We've mm. walked away mm. um, for one, a couple of clients. Well, I wasn't saying it was you. Yeah, <laughs> I know. So, there, I mean, there are some situations where someone can totally come into compliance and I know, at least for our clients, you know, they'll be looking at that. There's, there's thousands of facilities to yeah. look at. So, you know, my my thoughts on, on prioritizing cases is we should pick good cases. There's plenty to choose from. You shouldn't be picking the borderline ones. We should right. we should do the the more important ones. So, um, um, but again, that comes down is that you know there's always going to be some cases where you know there'll be maybe a difference of opinion whether that really met that whatever that line right. is. Right. Um, but I, generally speaking, I think it's a pretty reputable uh, set of groups who are doing these cases on a regular basis, at least certainly the ones I've been in contact with and certainly the ones that we assist. I mean, they're all cases that, you know, the levels have been measured and, um, you know, they're quite high compared mm -hmm. to whether it's EPA mm -hmm. benchmarks or these the new NALs and, um, you know, looking at those as well as you know whatever you can see at the facility because we don't trace right. on site we don't have any authority to show up with a warrant or anything like that but um, you can be pretty sure for the case at least we're trying to be sure when we bring these cases that these people don't have best available technology or best conventional technology and there's definitely things out there okay. they can put in and, and afford to okay. do it. Well that brings up the next uh, question is Melissa, I'll field it to you first. How can dischargers avoid lawsuits? What are some of the practical things they could do? And I know you're, you're, one of the Stormwater Awareness Week workshops is exactly on that. Right. So if someone wants more uh, detail, they can go to our website and see, I believe it's uh, Thursday uh, morning at your office in uh, Sacramento. But just could you run down some of the, the, the practical things that dischargers could do to avoid a lawsuit? Well, I think, you know, Michael probably would agree with me on this one that if you comply with your permit, there's not going to be a lawsuit. But I think because permits have gotten challenging in trying to understand what the requirements mm -hmm. are, I mean, there's no definition of what BAT, BCT is. And just because you're above the numeric action levels doesn't necessarily mean you don't have BAT, BCT, and the permit even says that. But it's there's not a really clear if you do this, you will be mm -hmm. in compliance. So I think everybody is still in jeopardy of, of potentially facing a, a citizen lawsuit just because the permits aren't clear. And I don't know that you know, having numeric affluence really you know, would solve that problem or not, but um, I think it would raise other issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's a few treatment systems that you know, my, our clients would agree, well, if you put that in, that's BAT if it's properly sized. And the permit, the new permit, 
uh, does at least give everyone, whether they like it or not, uh, sizing requirements. Mm -hmm. So one can easily look at that and say, if you size, you know, this type of treatment system, and it covers all of your stormwater, yeah, we would agree that's BAT. If you, and uh, likewise, if you can contain everything, and mm -hmm. whether it's whether infiltration is appropriate or just containment happens, up to again, they have sizes in the new permit. Um, you know, those are situations where we definitely said, yeah, we agree that's BAT, BCT. But sh shy of that, it becomes much, a little more subjective in terms of well, yeah. uh, what, the, what might happen at a given facility. And we, use, we do use the numbers to sort of gauge, like, if it's close. But if, um, you know, if, if people do actually put in what would be deemed the best, I mean, you know, in, in a reasonable way, um, you know, I think... There's going to be most sites you know, when you when you bring a case and you're negotiating, you sort of come to a, a somewhat reasonable place. Though a lot of facilities, I think, think they don't need to do treatment when they probably should be. Mm. And it also doesn't mean just because you've put in a treatment that they still can't claim that there's a receiving water limitations violation. So that's the other problem is, you know, one's a technology-based standard, the other one's a water quality-based issue. And, and so even if you've put in treatment, you know, the cause or contribute language still could come back. I don't know how realistic that is as a threat because I know all of our cases, you know, we definitely focus on BAT, BCT. And I had that problem. That's how, <laughs> that, that's how the, the cases resolve as well. And, you know, the presumption being if we can agree on BAT, BCT, then, you know, the cause or contribute, whatever that might be, is is not going to be the main. But in issue. I had a municipal case that they had already put in treatment technology. It was mostly a bacteria mm -hmm. issue for municipal stormwater. They'd put in ozonation to solve that problem and still got a citizen suit. So just because you've done what you think yeah. that you needed to do doesn't necessarily preclude the citizen suit, and it cost the city in that case a couple million bucks to it deal with is it. Is the problem in that you it's difficult to define BAT BCT? Is that part of the contributing problem? Well, that's part of it, but then you also need to know what the pollutants are in the receiving waters and, and try to focus on that because you don't want to be declared to cause or contribute to sure. any exceedances that are seen. And sometimes it may not have anything to do with you. Okay. Why but they are distinct because right. BAT, right. PCT is just what's the technology? I don't care what the water quality right. effect is. I just simply don't care. And you got to just put in the best, um, you know, whatever that right. might be. And, and then, um, but for a city, which you know, I don't, I don't quite think it's a, it's a, it's the proper analogy because most of the industrial facilities are not a city. They're, right. you know, maybe a couple acres, maybe twenty acres. You know, it could right. be a very large industrial plant, but it's never going to be like a city. Cities actually, where you have the cause and contribute language, is actually more important because, you know, those are the places that you know their whole stormwater system, whatever it might be, might very well, in fact, are probably the main source of any actual standards violation during rain events at least. So I don't, it's not quite analogous and you can't quite use the cities as an example. I think right. for a normal industrial facility, if the BAT requirements um, are met, um, and for example, say they put in a nice media filtration system that just covers all their stormwater and it's sized right. properly, that's BAT and most likely, or hopefully, um, depends, you know, there's some treatment systems out there that, you know, I'm not quite so sure I would agree there'd well, be BAT on that. That's going to bring up an issue because under the new permit it says you tell us what the BAT is and then if you can't afford it, then tell us what you can do and do that. Yeah. And so that's going to be an issue. Are those people then going to be subject to citizen suits because they haven't done BAT, but BAT has economically achievable in the definition, mm -hmm. and so there has to be some discussion of that at some point, yeah. but I don't know that people are going to be able to avoid it, litigation. Yeah, so if people do abuse those reporting things where they're trying to ratchet it back and they don't have a very good reason why they shouldn't have spent, you know, X versus yeah. what they decided to do and they avoided the obvious applicable technology, then, you know, yeah, I think that's, that's the way the permit will work out. At that point, we'll be able to go in and enforce the BAT requirement. Um, and I don't think um, uh, any of those provisions will prevent us from doing that. Um, so people should not, yeah. you know, take those two, you know, to too many extremes. They should be trying to 
you know, put in what is truly the best but available. But how do you take into account economically achievable then? Well, the, in the ideal world, you're not supposed to look at that. It's in the statute. By, <laughs> not, no, 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 not facility by facility well, though. In the, in the real world of BAT, BCT, which right, is not where a real world, I guidelines. Yeah, you're going to have, you look at all the facilities right. and you're going to say, okay, who are the top five or ten percent performers? Yeah. And that's BAT. And all the 90 percent, if the bottom 10 or 20 percent go out of business, that's okay. That's how a true BAT, BCT but he, analysis But he hasn't goes. done that for everybody. Nobody's done that yeah. for stormwater. But so you can't just, yeah. you know, to do it facility by facility is not quite right to begin with. But I'd, I would also say pragmatically, though, when we approach a facility with a case, for example, you know, that's basically the discussion we have is, okay, mm -hmm. how much can you afford to do? And, you know, we think this is the treatment system or type yeah. that you need to put in. And, you know, if you have something that works just as well or you think might work just as well, you know, right. tell us what you think. And maybe we can agree. Maybe we will say, no, we really think you need well, this it, particular thing. Well, it sounds like uh, there's just a lot of... Um, just ambiguity about BAT, BCT. And if, it's, if we're having this discussion here, you can better believe the dischargers are struggling at what is BAT, BCT. Of course, that's our, our discussion for Friday's uh, uh, panel discussion. We're going to talk about BAT, BCT and, and take a look at this. But um, that leads to our next question. Should state or federal laws be changed in any way in regards to citizen lawsuits? or maybe in mechanisms that lead to citizen lawsuits. I think you were already kind of addressing some of this, Melissa. Uh, well, actually, Michael, it's your turn. Why, Michael, what do you, what do you think? Um, in terms of federal law, I mean, I, I don't think there's any, any changes that I would have in mind. The only thing mm -hmm. I would think is the ongoing violation issue is, in my mind, is a, is a produces the wrong incentives. Um, so um, it, it makes people want, you know, more likely to file a lawsuit than not, okay. you know, even if there was a violation. Um, and on the state level, you know, oh, and the only the other thing I'd say on the federal level is I, I did write a paper a long time ago, and I have no idea how practical it all is, but I always was an advocate of having an administrative citizen enforcement option where you could actually have a citizen agency um, you know, proceeding where a citizen could initiate a complaint mm -hmm. and bring a case and have the similar incentives where, you know, a, a group would, would have some, you know, ability to get reimbursed for their time if they brought a successful case to an agency. So it doesn't have to be a federal court case. It would be an agency proceeding that anybody, you know, you don't need a lawyer to be there, but you might be smart to have one mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so that was one other idea I've definitely, I wrote out as a paper a long time ago, but you know, I'm not a politician obviously, so I don't know what the likelihood of that ever coming about would be. On the state um, level, I mean, there's definitely, every so often you'll see bills uh, proposing citizen supervisions for the water code and other yeah. environmental laws in California, which I would certainly think is a good idea, because I yeah. think um, it, it's the same issue of the agencies not having enough resources to, to enforce uh, the laws, and you'd try to build in, you know, obviously build in similar safeguards mm -hmm. in terms of notice periods and things like that. Mm -hmm. Melissa, what do you well, think? Well, I don't agree that there's not enough resources. I mean, I've had cases where there's been both a state enforcement action and a citizen suit going simultaneously, and so that's a problem because then you're you know, negotiating with two different entities at the same time. Um, I went back to Congress in 2006 to talk to them about reforming some of the citizen suit abuses that we're seeing, and one of the thoughts that we had was incorporating the um, Equal Act Access to Justice Act into the Clean Water Act. So right now, if you sue the federal government, you're limited in your attorney's fees to a certain dollar amount. So I don't understand why you couldn't limit the dollar amount mm. per hour when you sue a municipality, which is also a form of government, I don't know, on the industrial side. But at least for to, to, for some of my municipal clients, that would be really helpful. Just to hold it and to keep Right, it because they'd still get parameters. paid, but not as much yeah. and so yeah. there is I think some financial okay. incentive to some of these lawsuits. Well we want to leave enough time for some questions from our audience and so we're going to open it up to you now if you would uh, email in your questions we would um, want to uh, answer those questions and so let's take a look at what we have here uh, we had some questions already sent in to us all right well right here <laughs> and I guess you can kind of see some of the emotion coming out uh, uh, why do environmental organizations pick on small businesses? 
who are doing their best to provide jobs and a healthy economy and not trying to hurt the environment. I'll let Michael take that one. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think we... Um, I don't think there's any particular focus on the size of the businesses. Mm -hmm. We go after huge corporations. We go after the state. Um, and, we, and every so often there'll be a facility that we think is violating that is a small business. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then hopefully we'll be able to um, you know, adjust to that reality. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think there's any you know, effort to pick on small businesses yeah. uh, out there. Yeah, do you see, is it all over the map, different size biz businesses get targeted? Yeah, but I think it does hurt the small business more because a lot of these companies are just operating right on the edge and they're not making a big amount of profit. And if they have to pay, you know, 20000 50000 in attorney's fees that they don't see any real benefit, it's not something on the ground that they're doing to make their site better, it's just money going out the door to them, then I, I can understand the frustration. Mm -hmm. Here's another one, and obviously there is a lot of uh, frustration out there. Uh, this one, this one is more on benchmarks. So benchmarks for copper and zinc, um, according to this person, is ridiculously low, and hard are, are incredibly hard to achieve. Why are even slight exceedances of these benchmarks so aggressively pursued by citizen lawsuits? Isn't this just profiteering? Well, I think the the copper number, hopefully once the brake pads are changed. I mean, right now there's state law requiring in 2025 for brake pads to be changed. I think that's where we're seeing most of the copper and zinc is coming from tires. I don't know that there's any legislation trying to change that. But I think those are the, the two places that we see it the most. And, you know, I know Caltrans has a difficult time meeting those numbers. And, I mean, one of the issues is the industrial permit currently, and I think under the new one, doesn't count employee parking lots as industrial. And so if you could demonstrate that it's coming from your parking mm -hmm. lot and not from the industrial activities, the problem is where people have trucks coming in and dropping stuff off, then they may be getting... Or if you're located next to a freeway, air or, deposition. Yeah, right, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I mean, we're not looking for cases where people are just, a, you know, a hair above benchmark. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I agree that example mm -hmm. actually exists on the dock yeah. that I'm familiar with. Yeah. I mean, you're looking for sizable exceedances um, of whatever the numbers might be. Mm -hmm. um, the, I'd say, in my mind, the way I always approach these things is if, if people are above the TSS numbers, then there's really no excuse whatsoever. Like, you, there's no reason any facility in the state yeah. can't hit the benchmark for TSS with a little effort, yeah. or maybe a lot of effort in yeah. a few situations. But, you know, th that number's simple, and there's definitely things you can do to get down to uh, 100 or if it's 400 for 400, the new permit yeah. for the okay. max. Um, and zinc and copper, you know, you know, it's still a, it, it, for me. It's all just a gauge of um, of whether or not the technology is in place at the facility. So, okay. I mean, we're not looking for little um, little exceedances. We're looking for sizable ones. And you know, mm -hmm. those numbers fluctuate yeah. even at a facility. Sometimes yeah. they'll be below, and the next season they're you know five times or ten times over the number, okay. or whatever that might. You know, the, 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 there's a zillion variations on okay. that. Okay. Well, great. I think that's all we have time for, but. Uh, I want to thank you, both Melissa and Michael, for being here. I, I know this is highly an unusual event, uh, so we, we recognize you being here for our showdown, Stormwater Showdown at high noon. Uh, he didn't get too violent today, uh, but we appreciate Never. you being here in our studio, and we appreciate you, our viewers, being a part of this, uh, this great event. And so we're hoping that you can take advantage of other great workshops. There's many workshops being uh, offered throughout this week. So go to stormwaterawarenessweek.org. Also Friday's event, we're going to talk more about BATBCT. We had a good start today, but we're going to have in a couple of consultants and about three treatment contractors. And we're going to talk about how do you know if you're meeting BATBCT. So I hope you enjoyed this week. Thank you for being a part of it.